content. Yeah, so we'll, here's we'll the do, best of. We'll do, yeah, we'll just do some throwback stuff. Um, so I'll just jump back to chat. Um, oh, so, so George has responded saying, yeah, he's, he is paying attention. Okay. Your, your barbs do affect him. <laughs> Uh, I might let me jump in the call and I will um, monitor the chat. Yeah. Okay. So okay. So thanks everyone for joining. This is the last one for the year. Um, there was a last minute issue last week, which meant we had to push it to this week. And we'll just blame Patch Tuesday for it. If that's not a good excuse, then having the ability to get a few of us together in person, I'll use that as the alternate excuse. One of those may or may not be a valid excuse. <laughs> okay, so uh, so Steve is here. He's floating around somewhere in the building, making sure that if anyone is turning up a little bit late, that they can actually get in. Um, this month, we are in. We're finally in the Microsoft offices over in North Sydney. So yeah, I was saying to Steve, this is only the third building that I've known Microsoft to have since their all location since my initial engagement. Yeah, I'm guessing, Phil, were you at French's Forest at all or were you a, an Epping Road joiner? I'm guessing Phil was French's Forest because like Phil's older than me. Mm. <laughs> Phil, you have to turn the microphone on. <laughs> I, sorry, buddy, I'm, I'm uh, dealing with another matter. So I'm here only in presence, I will join when I'm deal when I've dealt with this issue. If that's all right. I'll yeah, no problem. Back to the no problem. Can. Sorry, buddy. Yeah, okay, no problem. It wasn't it wasn't an important thing anyway, so I shouldn't harass Steve. Oh, so, so normal with me, nothing important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, uh, so yeah, so Steve's wandering around downstairs somewhere. Ben, Ben's here. I shouldn't look at the camera because it might get confusing. Yeah, Ben is. Oh, you're, you're there. <laughs> you're seeing ourselves in, in reverse up there. Um, so, yeah, so we've actually got a full complement of people uh, today. Uh, and we've also got Fatty, uh, an old co-worker of mine in the room, also former Microsoft. Uh, I think was was SMS your thing? A Windows or, server. A Windows server, server. server. okay. Client. Yeah. So, yeah, remember when Windows Server was a thing that Microsoft actually spoke publicly about? It was it was quite a while ago. <laughs> yes. Okay, so uh, so for the agenda, fairly straightforward uh, this month. So I guess just anyone who wants to like who's new uh, wants to do a quick intro. Now I think um, I think most of the names sort of you know do look somewhat. Actually, oh, we've got additional people. I can't see there yet, so let me just see. So yeah, so once we get to the next section, uh, like anyone who's new uh, just wants to do a quick introduction, uh, whether you like unmute yourself to do it or just type a comment in, uh, whatever option you are more comfortable with is the option we would prefer that you, you went with. Uh, then we'll just talk a little bit about uh, 2022 meetings, some of the changes and what we'll, what we'll try to do uh, maybe not necessarily from January, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out as we get into January. And then I guess the main topic then is like nothing particularly structured, but I guess just an opportunity uh, to recap what are some of the changes that occurred around M365 uh, and, you know, and the, the management side or just you know, other related Microsoft 365 technologies that um, basically made the year a slightly better thing, a slightly better thing for you versus uh, you know some of the former uh, you know some of the changes that weren't in place then. So I guess just first up, like like anyone who wants to do a quick intro. So if there's anyone that's new um, or maybe someone we haven't seen for a while, uh, uh, if you want to drop a comment into chat or feel free to unmute yourself. Now to sort of looking at the list. Um, Quite a few of you are familiar names, but it does look like there's a couple of of people we haven't we haven't seen before. And I'll just make sure I can actually see chat. As per usual, we're a chatty group today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I don't think. Oh, okay, Jake. 
Okay, Dave, Jacob's typing. So mm -hmm. yes, we know we know the audio is working in that case. Um, so I will. My predict. My guess is that yeah, we've got we've got our European contingency on here. Yep, we've got our Australian contingency. Anyone from anywhere else? <laughs> Brisbane's part of Australia, Anthony. <laughs> like you, I guess we still need passport and. Oh, well, um, if I've got to get a PCR test to enter the country, it's basically like going to the country. Yeah. yeah. So I guess, yeah. So I guess, yeah, for now we can, yeah, just, at least, yeah, we'll still count Brisbane as a, as a foreign location, not as yeah. foreign as WA. I think they've still got fairly strict lockdown rules, but I think that's what WA has wanted for decades. <laughs> so yeah. I think they finally got they finally got their wish. Um, so let's then just sort of jump in then. So not really seeing too much activity in terms of introductions. Now, just to quickly talk about some of uh, the things around what will be happening from January onwards. So any of you who are Sydney based or do happen to be in a Sydney in Sydney on occasion, uh, hopefully we'll be able to stick to the second Wednesday of each month, is that uh, Microsoft Reactor is supposed to be opening up again in January, as long as nothing goes wrong in terms of, you know, COVID, additional COVID restrictions being you know, put back into place again. Mm. So I don't really want to say that we are doing it for sure, um, but for any of you who are Sydney-based, you know, if you are, are based in the city, uh, if you haven't been to Microsoft Reactor before, it's one of the old government uh, government buildings directly above um, one of the and one of the uh, or if you know Wynyard Station, like the the big elevator uh, or big yeah big elevator area or escalator area um, opposite Wynyard Park. Uh, so it's 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 very uh, convenient if you're in the city. You've got you know, fantastic access to transport underneath. There's uh, bird watching in Wynyard Park if you feel that way inclined. Really? I don't mean real birds. It's it's Bing Chicken Central. <laughs> so there's like no shortage of, of people feeding birds they should not be feeding. Um, so, yeah, so the plan is that hopefully, um, yeah, my guess is I don't want to plan it for January, so we'll probably do it for February onwards just to make sure. And doing it in January, I think, because it's school holidays in Australia, it's probably best for that one to be kept as a remote meeting unless Ben wants to fly to Sydney for dinner again. Uh, I, so I'm thinking about that. Yeah. I'm thinking every second one I'll, yeah. I'll come up for it. So, yeah. So, yeah. So for January, like assume it's business as normal and we'll just like, do it. It'll probably just be an online only or maybe I'll come over here again just to catch up with Steve so we can do something in person. Uh, but from February onwards, hopefully we get to get back into Reactor uh, like it's a good venue. Uh, they've got pretty much room sizes that can, that can accommodate. So just making sure that like, that we can get the days we want, etc. Uh, and if we can't get the days we want, as long as we can get a regular routine of you know the you know, first or second whatever of every month, that's all all I'm really concerned about. Um, so uh, we've already, I think, in last month's meeting. Uh, we spoke about some of the topics uh, that would be some of the focus things that we want for for next year. And one of the ones that came up was getting some people to talk about about the Mac side of things. Uh, so some of the different enrollment options, different management tools for Mac. So so my thinking for that again is we probably shouldn't try to do anything too major in January. Yeah. Like I think anything Mac related, a lot. I think a lot of us are in the situation where we know enough to sort of get things working. But when it comes to the Mac OS stuff itself, we kind of go, that's, mm -hmm. that's not me. Mm -hmm. So so I think that's probably going to be a better one for uh, for February. I guess the only thing that would make it really worthwhile for January would be anyone who wants to learn stuff for back to school for deployments. But all of that stuff has should have already been pre-planned out prior yeah. to now. So maybe February. And then the other thing that we'll, that, I was, you know, that we discussed last month and for those of you who weren't around last month was, you know, we really sh should make more of an effort each month to make sure that or every, you know, once a quarter, for example, making sure that we are doing, you know, more of a an endpoint manager specific 
session yeah. um, rather than it sort of being you know, something that we always kind of talk about but never specifically talk about. We probably need to go back to some of the earlier things of getting a bit more specific, going into you know, certain scenarios and basically picking some of you know, cherry picking some of the things that are more important to people things and and Ben's already thinking please don't make it application it's always going to end up being application yeah. so so the promise to Ben is that we won't tell him <laughs> it's application deployment that's going to be the topic <laughs> but we know in some form or another that that is always going to uh, to end up being there but I think there's yeah there's no shortage of stuff we can uh, we can cover um, it's just a matter of you know people nominating what are the things that you're struggling with uh, what's new and exciting enough to be worth looking at. Uh, but other things as well is I'm pretty sure for all of us, there are just giant sections of Endpoint Manager, Intune, et cetera, where it was something that didn't particularly interest us at a particular point in time for that feature set. And now we get thrown into it and people assume we know it, yeah, even though it's something definitely. that we have successfully avoided. avoided. So I think this was your experience with Skep, wasn't it? Uh, pretty much. I think yeah. that just comes down to I, I'm, I'm certain I'm not the only one on this uh, on this call that has gone uh, certificates. That's that's not my issue. I'm not I'm not in, I'm not in the network team. I don't care about certificates. The reality is, uh, as evident by uh, the uh, the dwindling uh, views of our engineering training videos on certificates, yeah. that no one else cares about certificates either. But yeah. it's so important yeah. that you just kind of have to learn, yeah. and that's exactly what you know. It was it was dunked in the water head first yeah uh, forced to learn and you know it's it's not that difficult really but it's yeah it's just one of those things that it's not fun yeah and i don't think it's ever going to be fun well just think one day when everything's cloud we don't need to worry about certificates oh sure yes yeah, yeah. cloud fixes everything yeah cloud does fix everything yeah, yeah. good logging well, as long as we can offload certificate responsibilities to the software vendors so that as consumers of their services <laughs> All we care about is whether their certificates are valid. Sure. That would be a nice world. Yeah, it would be. It yeah. would be. Um, valid. The problem is when they expire, you may not know. <laughs> well, did, that not, you did that not happen just a couple of weeks ago? <laughs> the, the, one of the core um, uh, certificates for all like UWP apps and things just failed. Oh, it, or it was failed. It expired. Yeah, and expired. Yeah, yeah, it was something in a particular build of. Windows 11. Windows, yeah, it was in Windows 11. Yeah. yeah, it was like, and it was already addressed in insider builds. Yeah, but they didn't. But they didn't yeah. push it out to everyone else. Yeah. yeah. So like, it's this is an issue that affects everyone, uh, and it's crazy that it continues to happen. Um, I've actually got a thing that we can we can uh, show off next year around, um, especially with like the skip certificates and things. So they need to be using Key Vault in Azure and have it automatically rotate if only they them. had that um yeah, if only microsoft had technologies yeah that address things like certificate renewals exactly <laughs> um i did so i was doing a little bit of work for a blog post that i'm writing uh around sort of setting up alerting for for the certificates that you enroll for your like your trusted root certs and stuff like that so at the moment there's the the, the best way that i've ever explained to people to sort of manage this sort of stuff is uh, oh, just like set a calendar thing mm. and in a year's time, just go and renew these certificates. So it actually turns out that when you uh, when you put the certificate up into the policy, it's it's there in uh, Base64 encoded content. Yeah. So you can, in theory, the, the solution that I have working now is that you can just set up a like a cron job that yeah. runs a function app that will just check it to see whether it's expired or not. And if it's within a range, it sends you an email or a Teams notification. So that's something that I'm go I'm working on a like a demo of, and we can, okay. we can do a demo of that um, next year. Um, but yeah, and it's not app deployment. It's not app deployment. Yeah, no, exactly. so you yeah, want to talk about it? It's, it's just more automation. Your day job. Yeah, well, it's your day job. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's not quite as much. Not quite day my day job. job. Exactly. Just, just a challenge around that. I mean, we do have a certificate expiry alerting function in our software, mm -hmm. but the developers looked at it. And um, the only thing unique about this certificate is the thumbprint. So you can't report on friendly names. So like you might just say, um, mm, you can. Certificate SCCM5 is going to expire, but I may have named it SCCM5, 55. I can edit it. <clears throat> but then reporting it on the thumbprint, then you go, 
get this message say like don't print such and such long hex to this sure. <laughs> um, it's gonna expire go like okay so if all you <laughs> if all you have is the thumbprint then yes um but specifically what i'm talking about is when you upload the certificate for deployment in a trusted certificate policy through intune then you have all of the metadata that comes with the certificate so if you so the, if you yeah, no, yeah. interrogate yeah. that through PowerShell, you can get everything. And if you export the certificate as a DIR encrypted certificate, which is the binary form, then you can get things like the custom extensions. That's so irrelevant. things like yeah, yeah, certificates are stupid. Whatever, who cares? <laughs> but anyway, there's a lot of stuff that you can do if you know PowerShell and yeah. you want to get your hands dirty. So this is definitely something that we'll talk about next year. So show up. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So then if we sort of look at it almost on a, like if we sort of just stick to it in terms of what a quarterly view of what we should be kind of aiming for, is it's almost like we should be doing like, so out of three, one of them would be something like very in tune focused. Uh, one of them will be like something that's, or oh, sorry, so let's sort of start off with the things we know. So something in tune focused, the second one would be something security focused, for example, because there's no shortage of defender related things we can talk about. And then the third one would just be the thing that's a bit different. Yeah, something that doesn't fall neatly into that category. Because I think if we have that structure, we can just keep looping, looping through that forever. Yep. Because for me to say to you, anything interesting in security this month, <laughs> there's, you know, someone in, someone in the group will put their hand up and go, oh, I love this, or I yep. only just found out about this. So if we sort of look at it in terms of those three, having that third undefined category or lesser defined category, yeah, for sure. that's just our wiggle room for things that just t completely take us by uh, by surprise. Mm -hmm. So it, yeah, so a pretty easy formula for us to uh, to stick to. Now the like, so where I sort of said in tune, like it might not be in tune. It could be something config manager. Uh, you know, even though I know that's not what drives most of the people on here, I know it drives some of the people mm -hmm. on here. Um, we might even, uh, we could even have to get special guests to wake up in the middle of the night for things like that. Yeah, and, and I think that's what we should be looking towards is trying to get some special guests um, yeah. involved. Um, it's probably a good question to the crowd of who would you like us to try and get on calls? Mm. Have a think about it. Comments in the chat. Please. Yeah. So, yeah, so there was, yeah, so some people I think if we can find the right people who don't have a concept of time zones that, you know, they, they don't live in the time zone, they don't exist in the time zone they actually live in. Mm -hmm. They are our best targets. Um, like, so, you know, and so basically for us, one of the big challenges we have with this time is trying to get US people. There's like six months of the year or so where yeah. things are okay. And then there's another six months of the year where it's like, no, I'm not jumping on it at 11 p.m. <laughs> um, You'd be surprised. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. So just finding the right person who's going to be awake at those times, who's more than happy to yeah. yep. to jump in, and or who who's got the ability to do it that late uh, without disrupting the rest of the family. So again, then just in chat, or whether you want to just unmute yourself to talk about it, um, if there's like anything else that you think we should be adding to the agenda for things we should be covering pretty early on uh, next year, uh, just drop it into chat so we've got a we've got a record of it. Uh, if you think of something later, just you know, email us or you know shoot us a copy on shoot us a message on uh, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, Twitter Meetup. Meet you know, there's smoke signals, yeah. Discord. Yeah, yeah. Like you are, There's no shortage of ways that you know that you can you can reach out to uh, can to find any of us. Signal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> signal. Is that is that where you get your political information from? It, it is. Yeah. yeah. Um, go Trump. Not not Frank speech. <laughs> Do you know what Frank speech is? I don't know what Frank speech. You know the My Pillow guy. Oh yeah. Frank speech is his it's social his media platform. Cool. I have yet to look at it because I know. I'll get I'll go down a rabbit hole yeah, sure. and I can't be I'll be looking at going nobody could really think this is mm. happening and 12 hours later I'll reemerge <laughs> as a person who believes these things are true. <laughs> um, it's like everything your relatives try to forward you on Facebook yeah. but taken to the 10th degree. <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay. So if they, yeah so if anyone else sort of thinks of anything just drop it into chat um, and yeah, probably sort of letting us know when you think of it means we've got more time to go through, uh, potentially find the right people if it's something that 
you know, between us, we, you know, we don't really have uh, good exposure to it. You know, within the group itself, we probably do. So other things as well, like any of you who want to have the opportunity to actually like jump in and do, like even if you're not really comfortable presenting to a group or anything like that, even if you just sort of want to jump in and do just a short bit, if it's something where like maybe you want to sort of get used to talking in front of people, et cetera, uh, you know, more than happy for you to use this as an opportunity. Um, now, uh, obviously, you know, online versus in person might be a little bit different uh, for you in terms of level of potential terror. Uh, so, yeah, but if you do want to sort of try some of those things out, if there's content that you're thinking of trying to put together as something you could sort of package up as something you talk to people about, you know, let us know so that we can, you know, like we are more than happy to let you jump in and talk about things while we sit back and, and learn uh, from what you're talking about. So with that, that brings us to really, I guess, the final part of what we're covering here, which is just, you know, some of the things that we found to be highlights for 2021, uh, but then also, you know, we want you to be jumping in. Now, we haven't gone through and listed everything out that we thought about. We just sort of started off just by putting in a few categories, um, you know, where, you know, some of these are much broader categories than others. But all we really want to do here is, you know, list off some of the changes that have rolled into some of these technologies over the last year that, you know, not the things that you saw that you thought might be interesting, uh, but the things that you're actually using. <laughs> Because I know sometimes it's easy to get excited about something, but then you don't actually get a chance to do anything with it mm -hmm. because of whatever your role focus is. So, so I guess from here, like either use chat um, or if you want to unmute yourself to jump in, we don't have to go through these in any particular order. Uh, but uh, but so I guess then I'll I'll start off with everyone in the room. If there's Anything in particular that's made your life easier? Filters. And yeah, filters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, this is before we before we really started this whole thing, I was like, oh, we should talk about filters. So I, I don't I don't know whether anyone uses these a lot, but functionally the issue with dynamic groups uh, mm -hmm. just not being fast enough for real like di like actual live dynamic grouping yeah. in in uh, AAD and in Intune was it basically just made it impossible to use. So um, we've all come up with our own weird solution to create dynamic groups that aren't actually dynamic. Um, filters sort of solved that problem. Um, it's it just allowed on the fly um, generation of who, who's a member of that group. Every single time the device or the user really sort of gets pulled uh, from the, the Intune management extension, which is just fantastic. So that's expanding out to different avenues. It was It's sort of rolled out to a, quite a small subset of uh, features in Intune, uh, but it is now getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and I'm hoping in the new year that we'll start getting more uh, filtering options. Um, but I think the primary, the only thing that's really a problem with it at the moment is the subset of uh, fields that you can uh, sort of group on um, are sort of limited to what we're looking at at AADs. Uh, so, you know, if we can get more data in, that would be nice. Uh, but yeah, that's something that I've really liked. And I'm going to throw a technology out there that I'm not going to comment on, <laughs> which is the uh, remote control stuff. The oh, remote help. The, yeah. Mm. Has so, anyone has anyone played with that? I it's 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 not what I do anymore, so it's yeah. not something that I've played it uh, played with. But I'd be curious to know if anyone's tried it out. So, are you okay taking a question on that? Do you know what question I'm going to ask? I do, and I can't answer it because I don't know the answer. What was the question I was going to ask? How much is it going to cost? <laughs> sort of. You're, you're really <laughs> Universal <close>. printing. <laughs> so, the, no, so the question that I had, and looking at some of the licensing stuff, it's not clear, and I think you might say correct, it's not clear whether or not someone with M365E5 would get it. And it's... I'll be honest, I don't yeah. know. So, yeah, so very much, very much like how Universal Print was in like the public preview for a very, very long time. Yeah. This will remain that way for a very, very yeah. long time until the powers that be figure out whether it's going to be included in the existing SKUs yeah. or whether it is a feature ad uh, that is bolted on. So there's, just, there's, there's no official answer. So the thing that I'm hoping, because it kind of makes 
the EMS product stack a lot a lot nicer. Like Intune, like I feel sorry for it because there's Intune. There's no Intune P1, there's no Intune P2. But if they add remote control to Intune and make it part of Intune P2 <laughs> and make it part of E5s, mm. like I'm happy. Like, like Intune's not standing there on its own anymore. It doesn't have this empty cell next to it in mm -hmm. the comparison tables. <laughs> you know, and people who've got the higher end version get the functionality. You know, perfect. You, you might be the only person that's excited with the idea of having another licensing skew to well, Intune. <laughs> now, see, but in this case, though, I, I view it better that they do Intune P1 and P2 <clears> versus <throat> doing an Intune add-on that's not included with EMS E5. Sure. Like that, that's, my, that's basically my logic there. If it's something that like – I can understand universal print being split out because it's something quite different – to other things, mm -hmm. and there is a consumption-based element, the same way that phone plans aren't part of your M365 side. Sure. But with this one, to me, that kind of seems – it's harder for me to argue that with remote control. Mm -hmm. But let's, let's see. Yeah. So, like, my prediction is they will do something that does not – gel with what any of us expect to happen that's normally you'll go yeah we sort of come up with our own ideas of how they're going to license it they'll do something different yeah yeah well, for sure yeah i know to to go back to the technical questions yeah. around it has anybody actually used it curious to know monitoring the chat if you don't want to talk you understand But I guess just while Anthony's typing in, one of the things that I, I do like about the docs article on it, or art, one of the articles on it, is I really like that they position it against other things Microsoft has, but they also position it against TeamViewer, and they don't try to dismiss TeamViewer. Mm. They will show you things that TeamViewer can do that it can't. So I, I was pretty pleased to see that. I actually had a question. I mean, maybe you can bring up that article, but... I did see like some comments around that. Do you, do you have to be in the same control domain of some sort of Intune membership or a CCM? Because Tim Miller, my biggest like about that is like my mom calls me about the problem like in Tim Miller. Yeah. Or you can or use on a Mac or whatever. It just doesn't have to be AAD, it doesn't have to have a live account. So if it's a Windows computer today, you can use Quick Assist because that's on every version of Windows. And here's a neat little trick. If you hit the Windows key Q during the UBI, so the out-of-box yeah, experience yeah, yeah. for autopilot, you can actually connect Quick Assist there and help people through that scenario. It's pretty unknown, but it's it's yeah. definitely there. Yeah. Okay. So Windows uh, and, uh, Quick Assist is on every version, right? What this does is this sits on top of that and turbocharges it so it's tied to only uh, AAD of your domain. Okay. Um, one thing to note, and this is based on documentation and what you see in the UI, is if you connect to the session as an admin, when you sign out, the user will be signed out. Uh, and what we mean by that is... If Mark connects to my computer with admin privileges and he does stuff and he needs to have that admin up there, when he start disconnects his session, I'll get logged out of the computer because we want to make sure that any that token session or any token that Mark may have there will be signed out. Sure. That's not a great experience, but I understand the logic. Yeah, so from a security point of view, it makes sense. From a... Uh, user experience it's different mm. and, and this is this is part of that conversation um, is we want to sit there and make sure you have that secure experience yeah it always comes back down to these bloody Kerberos tokens doesn't it yes it's always about the token yeah so I've just brought that the page up that goes through and shows everything. So I thought, it, yeah, so to me it was actually, like I did, so first of all, just including TeamViewer, I was impressed that that was listed. Yes. But that they're not hiding things that TeamViewer can do that the others can't do, for example. Correct. 
Now, I think overall, I don't think there's any, anything going unique to... that TeamViewer is doing, which kind of makes it easier to include. So in. the one thing that I know from a lot of conversations, if you scroll up just a touch there, Mark, for me, and see the two asterisks next to unattended mm -hmm. access, how many people think it's a good idea to have unattended access on your clients? Do not raise your hands. <laughs> <laughs> it depends upon the use case. I mean, I see no. where you're coming from. But... No, there is no use case where you should have an unattended workstation. It, it, if it's a server, fair enough. But if it's a workstation that one of your end users is signed into, you should not be unattended connected to that computer and you should not be connected to that computer if nobody is there on that computer. So this goes back to the old adage of, you know, you would go, like someone would say that, oh, their computer wasn't working and the, you know, the IT support would say, oh, that's fine. When are you going to lunch? Let me know and I'll jump on your machine. There's this expectation that that is an okay practice to continue using in modern management. And it is just not. Um, you know, there's there's no trust. What is stopping me, aside from keeping being gainfully employed, you know, getting access to your machine and doing anything I want? Yeah. At the end of the day, the most important thing that we're we're concerned about is user security and data security. Yep. And as soon as you let someone get access to your machine without them being physically there to monitor what you're doing, you have no trust in that device anymore. See, but that would that be on the at the machine level, or would that be doing things as that user as that user yeah okay because if it's doing it as the machine and you you've got an admin profile i see that being a different yeah the, the machine i'm not as yeah. worried about it's it's the fact that you're sitting there on a computer signed in as mark's account doing something on mark's profile mm -hmm. that like as an end user you shouldn't be accept, accepting that in 2021 What's stopping that IT professional from sending an email to your boss, sending an email to the executive, going in and signing, going and loading up Internet Explorer, sorry, Edge, <laughs> Edge, and using your saved credentials to sign into your bank account? Yeah. It's just, it's just not, it's not okay. Going They're, into your personal emails. <laughs> there, there, I, I, you, you, there's so many things we can step through and explain why this is a bad experience. And the thing is, as an IT professional, you shouldn't want to put yourself into that position yeah. because then you'd get yourself into a situation where you could be blamed for going in and making a change to a customer's document, yeah. to a customer's email account. And them just sitting there and going, oh, well, Mark was connected to my computer. Yeah. I don't know what he exactly. did. Or here's another one. Raise your hand how many times you've been uh, working on someone's computer unattended yeah. and their email keeps popping out with sensitive data. Yep. Yeah. How the, it's, it's countless, right? Well, how many people have got their machines hooked up to large screens yeah. while they're presenting and sensitive teams yes. yep. or email reminders and meeting notifications yep. are popping up yep. that have got, oh, I did not know that. I wonder what that code word is. Let me, let me start <laughs> searching for it. I don't know whose screen you're yeah. seeing. <laughs> um, yeah. So... Uh, the entire point of this is to minimize security vectors, right? And it just there's just no scenario where it's okay. Yeah. We've we've had this conversation in previous places we've worked out. We're going to continue having this conversation because everyone tries to conflate server remote access and end user remote access like it's the same thing. It is not. Yeah. And the other side of it is if you're providing support to an end user, they need to be there. You're not a lackey doing work outside business hours or when they're at lunch. Yep. Because they need to know what you're doing with their account. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, mean, I don't want to start this argument, but <laughs> I have different views. Right? I mean, Let's go. I can do <laughs> anything, right? I can hide the windows pop up. I can drop a script. Like, I mean, yeah. if you're looking at it, even if you're auditing it, you probably won't see it. Totally. So, oh, I mean, completely agree. Well, I, I take your point. Yeah, definitely. I read there. It's the trust but verify. So if my service desk analyst has uh, remote control access and he remote controls onto an executive's computer and has more privileges than he's supposed to have and goes off and does stuff, 
I don't have auditability on that help yeah. desk analyst. But that help desk analyst doesn't have permission to go and execute scripts on the client computers via Intune, via any of those scenarios. So I, I, I understand that I position as well. thinking of like a kiosk support, like, it's yep. same, like say it's so, going to pass across and it's a config change that you can't push or manage like one way out. So the the then, question then, is, if it's a true kiosk, you should be able to set the thing on fire and start it again. So it, it so okay. What you're what this so there's two things here. If it's a just a general, hey, this kiosk is not working. Can you go and figure it out? No, wipe it, start again. If it's hey, we need to test a thing before we roll it out, then you should have a kiosk machine there yep. and you should be testing it, verifying that, and then officially packaging up the solution and pushing it out to your machines. Yeah, typical yeah. scenario is like smart card or printer, so you actually have to, I mean, you can test it in your lab, but like yep. the store calls you. Oh, yeah. You go, Damn it, like it works here. Yeah. <laughs> and and that, one, that scenario is probably the edge case where, yeah, that makes sense. So um, those were, I mean, but, but again, there's limited things that those accounts can yeah, do. Yeah, I, for sure. I, I take point. your point, definitely. The scenario in that case would be like, and I've, I've definitely done this, it's been a very long time since something like that's ever come up, but it would be you'd contact, the end user would contact you to advise that there was an issue with the machine uh, or the terminal or whatever you want to call it. You remote onto it and you advise them, I will let you know when I am finished. Please let everyone else know that this device is unavailable until X. Um, you know, the, the entire point here is to minimize the amount of uh, issues or damage that you can potentially do. Not we can't we can't rule all of it out. Yeah. But if we can avoid doing things like asking them to write their password down on a piece of paper and stick it to their monitor, uh, you know, then we can also avoid yeah. uh, <laughs> unattended remote access to machines. Yes. And and. To be clear, we're talking the general 80% rule. We're not talking the edge cases. Yeah, exactly. Um, and the thing is we see a lot of people on the 80% going and saying, I still need to do unattended folk. Why? Like yeah. at our at, at a, an organisation where we've worked <laughs> previously, um, save. we've sat there and watched our staff connecting into people's computers in the US outside business hours so they can do work while the cleaners are walking around the office and things like that. And it's like well, no. that you can't do, guys. Oh, but we can yeah. turn the screen off and we can lock it. And it's like, no, no, no. Yeah. yeah. That is a security yeah. risk and the customer actually raised it with us as a major concern. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway. Back, back to your list, Mark. So yeah. um, that's a great list. Um, what I was thinking is I'm, I'm getting a lot of questions and interactions from the end users that are VMware and Citrix deployments. So, I mean, they're imaging optimization. So, and the fact that you can have Horizon in, in Azure and Citrix in Azure yeah. and offer desktop similar to this. I'm wondering if you can get a good partner or, or someone decent to talk. For that about, stuff. Because it's, it's quite a sizable deployment, yeah. but as you cover insurance and banks, there's massive footprint there. Yeah, there'd have to be someone we could W365 or as in, or probably more WVD so or AVD. AVD and, and Citrix, how does that so, work? So you're, you're wanting to talk the connection between the third party product and AVD, W365 or AVD and, mm -hmm. and the third party, or or the comparison between the platform the, itself, the, the integration of the platform. So, because I see the Citrix ad goes like, "Yep, Citrix Cloud, we still can do yada yada." Yep. Like, why do I need you? <laughs> I can yeah. do it all by myself. Well, isn't Citrix just like leveraging the APIs for um, AVD yes. for a lot of the tooling that they're using for cloud stuff? Yeah, it's presentation like Yeah, they just do a good overall management. Plane, if you like, I mean, sure, yeah. sure. Like, I mean, you don't need the um, well, yeah, because they're an abstraction layer over the top of it, and they've yep. been doing it for a very long time. Yeah. So, I would understand that they would do it a little you better. Don't need Nerd or whatever you just call yep. it, like, mm -hmm. it is. sure, yeah, yeah. For so, just, just a thought to add yeah. to it, like, I don't know if you have context, if not, that's fine, yeah, yeah not, yeah, for that stuff. 
like I just like if possible, I try to avoid anything VDI, VDA, <laughs> RDP, RDS related. Um, I, I just try to avoid that stuff like the plague because it reminds me of the early 2000s. Yeah. Um, now, I know it's still important to a lot of organizations, but sure. it just because it just hasn't been part of anything I've cared about for such a long time frame, I don't even know who does it. So the challenge that I have with things like Win365 or, or, or Azure uh, Virtual Desktop, I'm like, yay. I think it's actually RDP. Windows Virtual Desktop now. Is it? Uh, it, was, uh, uh, no, it, was, it was W. No, it's oh, AVD. They renamed it to AVD. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. Windows 365. Yeah, I know we went from one to the other. Yeah, yeah. 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 And we could potentially um, get Bruce to do a session on um, what he knows. Well, what I would be suggesting, and, and I'll talk about this offline with uh, yourself, but we'll see if we can get some people from PG around that. Yeah, yeah. could be uh, cool. On the Microsoft side, the Citrix component. Um, I reckon somebody on the call may be able to help us out from a partner point of view that we can have a chat to offline and see if you can help us out. Yeah. If it's if it's just to sort of showcase the ways that you can leverage it for management, because I guess it all has to come back to that skew of like, you know, the the, the group is about managing devices. Yeah. You know? yep. So we just need to uh, sort of think about that. But if, if anyone's got any questions around that or they're curious, uh, let us know as well, because obviously the, the key thing here is to sort of talk about the stuff that we're excited about. Uh, this year, but also, you know, if you've got questions about AVD or WVD or Windows 365, um, you know, leave the questions here and we'll we'll catalog them and try and try and answer them for you. You see lots of interest on WV365. Uh, I don't deal with people who would be interested in it. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. And they would if they know my it's not that I. It's not that I don't think things like RDS or yeah you know, things based on it are good solutions. Mm. It's just I'm a fan of having a PC, mm. and yes. I know it's not an exact comparison, but for me, it's just something that I've I've moved on from that I like. I would say that I've tried to actively forget mm. the early days mm. of desktop virtualization. I have I have too many scars from it that I don't want. Sure. I don't. It's, I don't want that scar tissue building up even further. Yep. Yeah. Um, curious. How many people on the call have played around with W three six five? If any. And or AVD. Grab another drink. Do you want a drink? Yes. <laughs> AVD. Yes. Not W three six five. So, and and forgive me if I'm wrong. But W365 is essentially just the um, uh, single single user AVD instance, right? With, with management Correct. guardrails. It's a fast implementation of AVD. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, I definitely like. I haven't played around with it, but I know use cases that would come in handy with this. And when they when the announcement came out that it was a thing. Um, the first question that got immediately excitedly asked was, do the the virtual instances have shared GPU support? Um, so my partner is in uh, the architecture industry, and that was the first question I asked as well, because if they had shared GPU support, then they could get rid of their on-prem remote solution uh, and and immediately have all of these uh, rendering stations just sitting there, just churning yep. through stuff. Um, I, I don't think that's a thing yet. Yeah, I think for that you'd need to go to AVD, where you could because then you're choosing what it is yep. you're deploying, yeah. and you could choose. Yeah. you could choose like what is it, the N series, N -series. that have got the they've uh, got GPUs. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, right. Okay, so it's just not a uh, it's not a, a skewed out uh, product in in W three six five yet. Yet. Still, yeah. I still haven't played around with it, so I, yeah. I could just be uh, talking out my proverbial, but it's, it's not uh, there right now. Yeah, I, I can answer that. It's not there right yeah, now. Yeah, sweet. But it's something that mm. kind of makes sense. Oh, I kind of it definitely makes sense. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm yeah. thinking back around a, a client that uh, Steve and I may or may not have been working on that uh, would definitely have benefited from uh, W three six five. Multiple. 
Yeah, I, I, I see it as a as as long as the the pricing model works out to be comparable to hosting it on prem, mm. um, th- it's n- not even a question. Like yeah. if the pricing is comparable, versus even if it's a little bit higher, if you don't have to manage the infrastructure, well, that's it. And and this is where why would you well, it's, yeah where, where W three six five did a profit <laughs> um, hmm? where W three six five has its scenario is it's the predictable cost and you manage it with the same tools you manage your workstation mm-hmm. fleet with because yep. it's all managed via Intune. Uh, one of the oh, but hang on, just another thing. Just while it just came into my mind, one of the other key benefits of this is that the operating system layer isn't a virtual, a fake version of Windows ten or Windows eleven. Correct. It's like an actual. Uh, it is a full version of yeah. Windows ten, Windows eleven. Um, the other thing to note on that front is it's so. In AVD, obviously, you have multi-session Windows 10, and that's the only place where you can do multi-session Windows 10. So it's a full version of Windows 10 over in AVD as well. It works well, it does everything you need, but it's still a multi-session OS. Um, Windows 365 gives you that simplicity. One of the things that is a good thing, but also uh, there, there's some people that may freak out about it, and it's, it's something to call out is the AVDs underneath W365 don't exist in your Azure subscription. Mm. They sit inside a secure subscription. Yeah. So there is potential concerns around data sovereignty if you're in a region that requires that. It can't be guaranteed, right? Uh, Ish. I can't comment on that sure. because I don't know enough sure. to give you that statement. Yeah, okay, okay. Um, but it's something worth investigating if, yes. if you haven't. Yes. Okay. But this comes down to if you are in a situation where that is a concern, spin up AVD and you can do the same thing over there. It just isn't as predictable from a cost point of view. Mm-hmm. Um, and the management point of view, you can still do in-tune management of AVD. Yeah. And also with there AVD, are limitations yeah. on what you can manage in AVD with Intune. Uh, it has to be on a multi session Windows 10, mm. but it still exists and it's still capable. But that key thing there, the difference between AVD and W365, is you can have a multi session AVD, whereas it's not a thing in, yep. in Windows. <laughs> Potentially. Yes, we will, we will ask uh, Christian. Yeah, I think yeah, I think he knows a thing or two about it. Yeah, yeah. There, there's another person in the PG around that space in our time zone that I may try to reach out to to see if he's interested. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I'll throw my my head into the ring now. Uh, I like that there is there are fewer Microsoft three six five Defender portals. That I have to go to. Yeah, I, I, don't. Want, I want Defender for numbers. Yeah. So I think <laughs> so I think I'm down to really two point. I'll say two point one. Two point one. Or two point oh one. The point oh one is the like if you've got to do anything with Defender for identity, it's the initial configuration, sensor download. But then once you do that, unless you really like the old timeline view, which I'm sure some people might like, um, everything else for that in terms of the reporting, et cetera, is over in MCAS. Actually, not allowed to say MCAS anymore. Mm-hmm. Defender for cloud apps. Defender for MCAS? Uh, no, <laughs> Defender for cloud apps, but not Defender for cloud. Sure. Defender for cloud is the Azure technology <laughs> that was Azure Security Center and Azure Defender. Mm-hmm. So we went through this stuff last month. We we had fun with that stuff. Nice. Um, but the, yeah, so, so basically now the Defender side now that you get to see Defender for Endpoint and the Defender for Office 365 stuff grouped in with the overarching Microsoft 365 Defender stuff, some of the benefits there is now you've got your threat hunting across M365. So if you want to do you know, KQL queries, you don't just have the ability to, to do it against Defender for Endpoint, which has always had them. Now it's right across everything in M365 Defender without you having to pump yeah. it into a log analytics workspace. So some of that stuff is is really nice. 
Um, the uh, and then just in general, just to sort of tie it into the Sentinel piece, um, just some of the enhancements they're making to the Sentinel connector around what you're choosing to bring in into uh, yeah from M365 Defender, especially on the device side. And this was one of the things that I mentioned in last month's meetup was, you know, sometimes you'll see blanket comments even in Microsoft material where it will say, you know, this you know, data from this particular set of connectors is free of charge. But if you look at the Defender for Endpoint connector, it's only certain things come in free of charge and most of them do not come in free of charge. So the updated Sentinel connector for M365 Defender, it lets you choose on a table tape by table basis what you want to come in. So what you could really do here with, with M365 Defender, use that to, because anything that's coming in to Sentinel is gonna be stored there first. So you don't necessarily need to suck everything out of M365 Defender if it's not free into Sentinel. Mm -hmm. um, your alerts are still going to come in um, and, Potentially, it's going to save you, like if you're talking about doing this on a fleet of desktop or desktops and laptops, those logs in being ingested into Sentinel, that is not going to be cheap. No. So you basically can pre-filter. You're still getting it into Microsoft 365 Defender. You've got 180 days of data retention in there if you want it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure you could still suck that out to another log analytics workspace if you really wanted to. Sure. So, yeah, so just some of the, the additional flexibility they're giving you there. Uh, like I think at the moment, like I'll, I'll, I've said a few positive things. I have to say something negative. It's like you know, having the M365 Defender connector and then having all of the other ones sitting alongside it. I, you know that people are going to be configuring something but out, without realizing that there are other things that they could be getting more granularity on. Yeah. But all up just that, like that, that space has improved. Um, you know, I don't, yeah, I don't really think there's anything major that's really changed with the Azure de Defender to Microsoft uh, Defender. Yeah, Microsoft Defender for Cloud Story. Um, like that's just kind of a lot of incremental pieces. And I, I probably just now the naming is simplified, so that's probably the biggest thing there. Sure. But the functionality changes on the M365 side, um, the portal uh, being able to do your queries directly in there, uh, you know, all all steps in the right direction, not having to go out to old securitycenter.windows.com or your compliance.microsoft or compliance.office.com. Mm -hmm. So just sort of getting rid of a couple of portals. Um, where, and that's yeah, basically the vast majority of what you want to do would be in in the M365 Defender portal now. So for me, that's that's been a really big one this cool. year. So this kind of comes in potentially um, because of all like the reason that you're getting all of this in, in a sort of a single mm. thing is because the APIs in the back end have become more unified. Yeah. Um, it is something that I've been keeping a sort of a low level of uh, sort of reporting on Every now and again, I'll just notice that they're adding more and more documentation to the to the websites. It's going to get to a point where we're going to actually going to be able to start leveraging the Defender APIs in a better way than we previously did, which was just to go on there and look at, oh, alerts have been created. Yeah. Um, I have yet to play around with it, but I think functionally we could be in for some really cool stuff. Um, yeah. And then I'm waiting for six to 12 months time, probably 24 months time when they turn around and go, oh, it's all going to go into graph now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it's already on a graph. It's just, just not the right graph. It's not yet. the graph. Well, it's a more secure graph yeah. because you can't get the metadata without signing in. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so I know we don't have Office on the list here, but I do have one feature that, I, that came out this year that I think everybody should be enabling. Mm -hmm which is the OneDrive Sync Health Report. Ooh. Um, so what, you mean we don't have to look for the icons anymore? Well, it means you don't have to go to each computer one by one to see if the computer's in sync. Yeah, sure. So one of my customers, uh, they literally deployed this for their migration. Um, their a multi-thousand seat organization mm -hmm. and they found that 20% uh, of their organization had issues with syncing. Really? So it enabled them to then collate the information and say, 
these users, I need to go and do this. These users, I need to go and do this to actually uh, to go and remediate the issues. Um, is this something that is relatively new, the sync health thing, or uh, it's been around for about three to six months now? Okay. Um, and highly recommend to go to config.office.com, uh, and it's on the left hand side. So it came out about September timeframe, um, and it's still an early. It's okay. Option. So I'm on the OneDrive sync reports. Yes. Uh, so according to the docs, everyone's favorite website, uh, the feature is in preview yes. and isn't available to everyone. Uh, Review the requirements to determine eligibility. I think it's available to, oh, so long as you've got like a certain license kit. So let's have a look. Requirements. OneDrive sync apps on the insiders or production ring. Yep. Devices production. on the deferred ring aren't eligible. Okay. Uh, OneDrive sync app version needs to be 21.078 or higher. Support for Mac is not available yet. Uh, you need to have a GA role or Office Apps Admin role yep. to set up the dashboard. After setup, only global reader role is required to view the dashboard. Mm -hmm. um, and um, devices have the ability to reach okay, config.office.com. Yep. Okay, so, okay, so I've got it in this yep, tenant. Yep. Oh, and also there are specific regions uh, that are not eligible. So um, 21 Vianet, Office 365 Germany, Office 365 GCC, or Office 365 GCC High and DOD, um, so, which would mean that the data is not being um, stored in a... Uh, well, no. What it means is those uh, data centers haven't been let up yet. Oh, sure, sure, sure. That's sure. all it means. Yeah. Um, so what you need to do is deploy a sync key, which is under settings. If you go to the left-hand side, Mark. Settings. Uh, and then in here, if you see there's that key, yep. that needs to be deployed out. And there's documentation under the OneDrive sync icon. Mm -hmm. oh, so is that pushing it out to a log analytics workspace? Basically. That's what it... Hmm. <laughs> I'll have to do a character count comparison to see if it looks like a... Why don't you just decode the key? <laughs> well, just the... Uh, well, because they're not actually giving you the... Uh, the endpoint name because that would be hard coded in. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Whereas normally you'd have the, you'd have to sort of give your unique endpoint name as well as the uh, the key. Mm -hmm. I don't know where it goes. I don't know where it lands. Um, the one it would make I sense that they're dog fooding log analytics for this, but yeah, yeah. yeah I just is, yeah I just assume anything like this is going into log analytics, and if it's not, why not? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you click on the OneDrive sync. Button. Yep. Fully. Yes. Uh, and if you then look at details or your reports, the one thing that it doesn't have today is the ability to export your report. Um, so, yeah, that's probably the only thing that I found not positive on. Sure. It. So it's just and view at the moment, not. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it's something that I would assume will be put in before it makes it public, but I don't know. This is my assumption. Yeah, cool. Um, but generally, though, how problematic is OneDrive Sync these days? Because once they, once they switched away from Groove, like I never no. saw, or personally, I never saw issues with it. So after Groove. The reason why I'm saying it's, it's still very often is if you're in an enterprise environment where you've deployed folder redirection and then deployed OneDrive. If it doesn't one work, it's a really major issue. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. even if it's only one or two cases, you know, every couple of months, it's still like this is critical. Yeah. And, and you can't build your confidence on yeah. if it's syncing or not. Yeah. Um, so that's why having something like this to be able to report on it um, is awesome because if you've ever tried to report on it before this agent oh, exists. Absolute pain. What you had to do was report on the icon overlay that was put onto the OneDrive folders to see if it was in sync or not. So we're essentially we we're programmatically looking to see whether the icon had a tick on it or not. Correct. That was legitimately the solution that yep. people had built. At this point too. I don't know, yep. I'm like you, Mark. I mean my colleagues even get OneDrive sync issues. Like we have documents and sheets yep. shared, and 
You know, like I can't see it. Like, like what? I've never had any issues yeah. in the last six years. How come you have every week issues? With it? Yep. So, and Eddie's Eddie's just raised a, a statement here. So the end users are generally clueless about when their OneDrive isn't working. And like, yeah, that that's one way to think about it. The other way is they shouldn't need to know. Yeah. Like they shouldn't be checking to see whether the whether OneDrive is working or not. It exactly. should just work. So, and, like, and, I fully understand that. And, and that's it. That that is where we should not be putting the onus on the end user. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we as IT admins shouldn't have to check to make sure it's in sync. And I guess with us, we probably notice something quickly if there was an issue because I'm going to hazard a guess that most of us sync to more than one device. Yes. So yeah. we would see instantly if something wasn't and synced. And we also notice when there's a balloon or there's a red yeah. X because yeah. we all just sit there and go, Oh, there's a Notifi problem. notification. Oh my god! Oh my god! What? What? Hang on! Hang on! The the, the restart button. Why did thirty four like right now? It why? just popped up. I just need to restart right now. Why did I get a notification saying thirty four thousand files have been removed from my OneDrive? <laughs> <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> when you delete the uh, SharePoint mapped drive. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not that we've ever done that at all. So what do we? So we've gone through we've gone through quite a lot of these, uh, Mark. What was your highlight with Azure Active Directory? Yeah. Um. Not nothing major with that one. It's just I do. there. Um, search was improved, so yeah. you could actually Usually search better. Search and filter. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and the filters, uh, all the preview features that came in, um, like all the conditional access stuff that went GA. Yeah. Would, that would be it for me. Yeah. Um, the ability to associate a role to a group and yep. PIM to a group has been awesome. Mm. Um, one thing that I, I hate that we've done it, but I understand why we have nested group support. <laughs> Um, but that's still got a bunch of restrictions around it, doesn't it? Nested groups. I don't know. Or I have they avoided at all costs. It is so yeah. painful to manage. Yeah. It's a neat trick if you are stuck with nested groups. <laughs> Quit your job. No, no. <laughs> Mark, can you bring up the MiMac portal for me? There's actually a really cool trick if you've got nested groups. Mm -hmm. This is weird because I've got that shared as my second screen. Yes. That's why there's the lag with everything I'm doing. Oh, I was wondering why your uh, device why was. Why don't you just unplug your. Uh, because then they'll see what I've got on yes. screen. Yeah, fair enough. Um, <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> oh, we just talked about this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so if we go yeah, to the Me Back tab, um, and if we then go and hit uh, all services on the left hand side, and hit uh, with a, uh, Intune for Education. Oh, oh that still yeah, exists, we didn't realize. did. We do that in this. Uh, we had a we had an education person yeah, yeah, yeah. showing this stuff up. Yeah, so they've actually got a really good solution for this. Yeah, yeah because it's actually based on schools. Mm. But if you go to groups on the left hand side, I don't even know that this still existed. Yeah, yep. yeah. Um, so see where it says MES parent? Yeah. If you expand that out, that's a nested group. If you can use your mouse. He's got a bit of lag. I can almost do it. <laughs> there we go. So you'll see it's got a nested group. Yeah. So going into this portal, you'll actually see where they're nested and how they all interface mm, with each other. That's really cool. And okay, so and th this is the the ultra nerd. Please don't do nested groups, please, please. There are still okay, so there's still documentation that advises that doing nested groups, the policies may not apply properly as well. So like, yes. let's just err on that and don't do it. <laughs> um, but the nerd in me is now thinking, well, if that data is there, that means the 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 grouping exists as metadata that I can look That's at, correct. and we can build our own UI. Yes, you could. <laughs> please don't. Yeah. Okay. That was um, something that I uh, stumbled upon the other day um, is with um, with dependencies for, for applications. Yep. See, we're back on applications. 
Um, Not really? Yeah. Uh, so dependencies for applications, if you create, so A, B, and C, and you make A dependent on B and B dependent on C, and then you try to remove B, it's going to say that there's dependencies that aren't working, but you can't ever really see the parent. You can only ever see the child from from the MIMAC portal, um, but the data exists. It's there, and if you actually look at it through graph, you can see the parent-child thing. And if you go into the parent app and go onto the relationship, it builds out that design, but only from the parent layer, um, which is very frustrating. So I'm working on a better solution in my own time. You should. Mm. Anyway, that's that's enough app talk today. So this ten minutes. <laughs> Okay, so what else? We haven't heard too much from anyone who's remote. So anything on the list or anything that didn't make it onto the list that is still made elements of your job somewhat more manageable? I know George has had some great experiences with certificates. <laughs> We've already talked about certificates. You weren't here. Oh. Um, but George, George yeah, we don't have a, we don't have a low light slide. <laughs> <laughs> Every year it's the same. Um, something that I just uh, read that is I think it's come out now, and this is a real small thing, um, but uh, the latest version seven of the uh, the Azure PowerShell module is now using MSL for authentication and not rolling its own weird authentication solution. Um, so that's huge. Um, because it essentially means that the Azure PowerShell module will now be in lockstep with what it's suppo supposed to be doing and not trying to reinvent the wheel. It's a real small thing, but uh, it's it's going to generally help everyone understand that there's a correct way to do things. Yep. Um, the other thing that from the endpoint manager, I know we're waiting for other people to jump in, but while we're waiting, put your hand up or put Just, a message in the yep, chat. I've got the chat um, open. So the Mac stuff that we've brought in. Uh, so we can now do not just uh, PKG files, you can also do DMG files mm -hmm. and convert them into applications using the Intune Mac format. Uh, we've also added support for custom settings using plist configurations without That's having cool. to do a whole heap of customization. Um, and there's some shell stuff in there as well. Um, and if you really want to nerd out is the ability to add Mac devices to Apple Business Manager after purchase without having to go to Apple to get it changed over. Um, yeah, so, crazy that that's yeah. a thing that's only just happened. Yeah, but you do need to have Monterey on the OS and do need to have iOS 15 on your mobile phone with the Apple configurator to application I believe is in the store. And if it's not, you just need to sideload it from a Mac. But it works really well. Um, Anthony just uh, said no one's talking about Windows 11. Um, I, I believe you've put your hand up to talk about it, Anthony. Yeah. And like we've yep. deployed it to all your staff already, right? Silence is golden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, like so I thought about putting Win 11 up there, but it's. Like, I don't know if I've seen anything yet where I've gone, oh, actually, you know, there is the enhanced snap capabilities, mm -hmm. like picking where I want something to be snapped to, oh, apart from Teams, because, of course, Teams doesn't cooperate, uh, but Teams still wants to be dragged where it has to go. So I'd say that, yeah, I'm going to nominate um, at the top of the list, I'm going to book Windows 11 enhanced snap Capabilities. AKA less uh, uh, less good version of power toys. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed, exactly. Um, what was what one of the other low lights? Um, win, <laughs> Windows 11 uh, apparently, and this is just from from uh, reports um, that you can't use the uh, the store for business through the company portal, or like you can't get to the company portal through the store. You know how you used to be able to go into the store for business and flag specific apps so that you could go through and do all that sort of stuff. Oh. You can still do it in Windows 10. Let me check. Apparently, oh, you can't do it. Yeah, in, I think, oh, hey, yeah, hey, because hey, they're hey. publishes Microsoft Store apps as yes. pri in private yeah. store. Yeah, yeah, the private store thing. Yeah, yeah. that would check. surprise me because yeah. Windows 11 is referencing the new store APIs, not the old yeah, store. Yeah, correct. So yeah, so the things that you that are 
pushed to you through Intune, for example, they still show up. But yeah, yeah there's yeah, I hadn't even thought of looking for that. There's nothing in here. It is by design. I understand yeah. it, but it's it's just something that I haven't even really thought of until someone um because even now, if you go to yes, the, Eddie, Eddie, yes, yeah. Windows Stories, Dead Man Walking, 20, yeah. 2023, and somewhere in there. So even though the current or the old approach still works of you know syncing, like purchasing through Store for Business and doing the sync, that mm -hmm. still works. Um, but if you go into Intune and say you want to add a Windows Store app, yeah, it basically gives you something like the Google experience, which is paste the URL in, find an icon, yeah. Yeah. put in a description. So, yeah. so that so to me that's a step that's a big step backwards. But like come on everyone, list your top ten Windows store apps. So here's the thing though, Mark. <laughs> that's my challenge. If you're needing to publish a and deploy a Microsoft Store app, it's available in the business store by grabbing the um, identifier out of the URL and changing it to a store for business yep. link. Mm. Um, there's a couple of articles on the internet around that. Um, so you can go and publish um, apps that are only available in the public store. A good example of that is the Dell Audio Max Wave application that is required for uh, the Dell sound cards to work uh, with headphones plugged in that catches so many people out. You can, and it's only published in the Microsoft Store. You can actually go in and change it and deploy it out via the Store for Business. Yeah. So, so this is kind of funny. Um, Every everything that people have dropped in in terms of like your go-to business or Windows Store apps. That's pretty much the list that I've got in business store. Yeah. <laughs> Mailing calendar is one that um, doesn't exist in the business store that you want to remove. Yeah. Um, so Adam uh, Gross did a really good blog on how to do this. Yeah, and I don't think WhatsApp is in the business store, but it's in consumer store. Mm. So yeah, so there's yeah, so you could already sort of see that you know not everyone had bothered doing business store because there wasn't that much uptake. Yeah, yeah. and you know Microsoft doing a bad job of keeping the demise of store secret mm. just meant that there was no intention. But one of the things that I do like that somebody called out in here, this one, people go, why on earth would you use it? But, um, you know, Eddie dropped in iTunes. Getting iTunes this way is fantastic. If you want to get, if you need to do, if you want to do proper USB tethering, like you're not installing iTunes for the sake of getting iTunes. You're putting iTunes on because it's got the driver support so that you can actually do USB tethering mm -hmm. through your phone. And every now and then when I have to do that, it's like, oh, so yeah, so I've got iTunes as one of the default packages I push that out to awful. my own machines. Oh, it's absolutely <laughs> terrible. But all you have to do is launch it to make that feature work. You don't need to sign in or anything. Sure. And it, it automatically gets updated because it's a store yeah, app, yeah, you know, yeah. delivery optimization. So, so there's a lot of good in terms of the technology, despite it being the, one of the worst apps ever built for and Windows. no longer being maintained yeah. either. Well, it hasn't been maintained for fifteen years. <laughs> yeah, it was always like, can we get our Mac code to work in a cross compiler and put it out on Windows? And someone said, sort of. Why? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because nobody's wanting to buy a Mac just to manage their um, iPod. Yeah, it's true. It's the only reason why yeah. iTunes exists yeah. on yeah. Windows. Um, for the I, first three versions, it did not. Yeah. I've got something that's it's not really management related, but it kind of is. Um, I stumbled upon this today. I just put it on Twitter earlier. Um, I had to go on to um, Azure DevOps for the first time in a really long time because my um, the API key for the PowerShell store had expired, so I needed to renew it and update secrets and all that sort of stuff. Um, and all my actions were throwing these uh, sort of warning notifications on it, advising me that the... Um, the run host that I was using was going to expire soon and that today and a bunch of other days they were doing intentional brownouts to make people go, why isn't this working and go and read the message. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the Visual Studio 2016 server host is being removed on March 15th, 2022. Um, so anyone who has got actions that just or uh, you know actions and run things that just always work, 
that are based on that uh, will run That's into a rude awakening. That's hilarious. Yeah. Um, so that's that's something that's uh, not only for DevOps but also for GitHub Actions as well. I know that's arguably not really in the same realm of what we're talking about in this, but it is. It's important enough that it's gonna it's gonna sting some people. Yeah, it is. Um, anyone that has got uh, actions that do work for you, anyone that's had a consultant to come in <laughs> and do work say. for you, um, you're gonna oh. want to you're gonna want to review all of those tasks I and you're gonna want to update. I can think of a couple of our uh... yes. <laughs> I'm putting my hand up and saying, if I've ever done any automation for you, you probably want to have a chat with me. Oh, I shouldn't be laughing. By March 15th, 2022, George. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, George. I'm just going to paste this here. <laughs> Yes, it was a quite quite a rude awakening when I said it was. Yeah. But it was all it was was just change the drop down to the new version and away you go, right? Or you just change the YAML. Yeah. But yes, it's not it's not difficult. No. Could could this be tomorrow's Y two K? Tune in to find out. <laughs> Watching all the PowerPoint starting to cascade fail because somebody's still using a twenty sixteen build server. <laughs> Mm. I mean, the good thing is, is that when they fail, they've got emails advising them that it has failed and they'll log in, they'll see the error. And hopefully they can put two and two together. Only if the consultant added an email for one of the employees. Yes. That consultant may have made sure that every uh, one of their customers was the owner of the organization. <laughs> That's good. Yes. Yeah. That consultant was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> Middle to average. Anyway. <laughs> okay, so any anything else that anyone wants to just sort of jump in and add either add to the list or expand upon anything we've covered off? Otherwise, Ben and I are just gonna sit here and heckle each other. I haven't seen him in a couple of weeks. Yeah. We've got it's a lot been, to catch up on. Yeah, has it been a month? It's yeah, been a month. It's been a month. Oh, Eddie was typing in the Discord. I'll have a go. I mean, okay. it's not for everybody on the call, but of course and it is. I may have missed it. Sorry, I've been in and out of it. M365 Lighthouse. It's a good one. Oh. Is it working? <laughs> is it real? <laughs> is it real? Is it a myth? <laughs> Is it a figment of our imagination that there's a technology called M365 Lighthouse? I'm not going to Clearly, it is a figment of our imagination. It's an apparition. I'm going to let you run with that one, Phil. I'm not getting involved in it. Okay, well, I, I, I better leave it alone too because uh, I'm pissed off it's not here yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost here. Well, it's been it's it's, almost here for 18 months. Yeah. But it's so it's still preview. Did we say Windows 365 or Microsoft 365 Lighthouse? Microsoft 365 Lighthouse. Sure. Not Azure 365. Uh, not Azure. No, no, that one's here. Azure, Azure Lighthouse. Lighthouse has been real for a while. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Since we had the last Ignite in person. Yeah. 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 yeah I actually was, and that was Inspire. Not yeah. It was Inspire where went to one of the. Lighthouse preview meetings with a tall ginger head gentleman, both of you know. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, I just want to and point out everyone. excited by that. Oh, he was, yeah. And it didn't work how he wanted to do this. <laughs> just uh, go, to the, go to the form uh, to register your interest in uh, Microsoft uh, Lighthouse. <laughs> do you want crickets again? No, I want, I want to hear the laughter. Mm. <laughs> It's so popular. I'm sorry, the Microsoft person. To, I'm really, really sorry. <laughs> yeah, they've had to block the form and they're inviting people in <sighs> phases. <laughs> oh, so I didn't okay, so I didn't actually realize that it was hadn't even gone into public preview. 
To be fair, no. though, I, when I was doing the universal print stuff and it was in public preview, all the documentation still talked about it like it was in private preview. So, And when we were playing around with the universal print, it still had licensing issues. Okay, so yes. do we do we want to do our twenty twenty two predictions? I now, yeah, Steve. Steve is ruled out of this one, and so and basically, don't look at any of us as we make predictions. <laughs> I've got a my prediction based on Phil's <laughs> submission that we may see a public preview of the delivery optimization server that doesn't require Config Manager. I'm not willing to commit to there being a GA version. But I'm willing to commit to the connected public, the connected cache one. Yeah, I'm willing to commit to the potential of an announcement of the public <laughs> preview. So you should be in to be, <laughs> Yeah, to be very yes. <laughs> Today you can build a Microsoft connected cache server in your environment, but it's not as cool as how they're doing it. The way they're going to be doing it is. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Today, Mark. I don't I don't want I don't want to dumb ass, sorry, a doink server yeah. in your environment without config manager connected to Intune to do your delivery optimization. What's wrong with that? Explain I, to me why that's not exciting for you. I don't want an IIS extension. I want a container. Thank you very much. Okay. Because I need to spend more time learning about containers and this would be a valid thing. I do not want to learn anything more about IIS. Okay. I stopped wanting to learn about IIS 20 years ago. Thank you very much. But I don't think you need to worry about IIS. <laughs> no, Doink uses IIS. Sure. Well, it's not yeah. called Doink anymore. And I Here's my prediction. Yeah. It's called Doink when it goes public preview because oh, yeah. it's the coolest Doink. name. And well, they change, and they'll change the C to a K. So <laughs> <laughs> It'll be Defender for Connected Cache. <laughs> So, Jerome, does it does it strip out that uh, beautiful? Uh, oh no! So, so, for Windows 11, have you updated the script to pull out the inbuilt Teams client that you don't want deployed on your corporate machines? You can't unless you run as an MSIX uninstaller. We've got a uh, Adam wrote Sorry, a blog. Sorry, right? didn't say that. Yeah. Yes. Oh, have you seen the new Notepad? The dark mode Notepad. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I don't Is it know. not just VS Code. <laughs> Uh, hang on, this <laughs> machine hasn't got it. Oh, no, it's got it, but for some reason. Um, Phil, you have your hand up, I see. Yeah, you guys are having fun. I didn't want to interrupt you. It's all right. Interrupt away. Um, so your perspectives on merging of the management of M365 and Azure together, and with specific reference to the thoughts of the old system center days when it used to cover servers and clients. What about Azure Stack HCI, Azure Stack Edge coming into that portfolio? Oh, Stephen's put his head down. So, oh, so Azure, I've broken the mirror. I'm liking the stuff I'm seeing with Azure Arc. I'm willing to go that far. But how does that play out then with Intune? Uh, well, Arc would be targeting servers. Oh, it's too confusing. Too many products. You work for Microsoft. You're not supposed to say these things. You're supposed <laughs> Nothing's to say educating. More, more products and more variations of SKUs of each product. New names every week. I'll pause. You've made a very, <laughs> very good point, Mark. <laughs> you, you, you said the magical word Azure Stack, Phil. I don't want to talk about that. I, I've forgotten all references to it. <laughs> Oh, mate, yes, yes, that's right. You had your part of your brain removed when you joined us, didn't you? Yeah. That's the onboarding process, right? Yeah, yeah. I had to rewrite parts of my disk so I could actually, like, <laughs> focus on As technologies you, yeah. I care about. That that twi twitch has gone away, mate. Yeah, pretty much. It's I'm sure you yeah. it's all I, I, I do wonder. I've got lithium. partners at the moment who are trying to do hybrid stuff with Azure Stack Edge and Azure Stack HCI, and it's a mixed bag of emotion. I'm not shocked. Are they still using the PowerShell script for the install? A CLI. Oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll stop talking about Azure Stack because I don't want to relive it. Well, Edge drives me nuts. 
HCI is not so bad, and it's a lot of investment in that. I'm pretty happy with the direction and the but Edge is driving me mad, particularly for one partner who's wanting to, one customer partner who's trying to do a lot with it, and I'm just going nuts because it's just too hard. Depends on how they're installed when you remove them, um, if they come back when you do a reset. What? Depends on how you remove them. Yeah, no, that's what I mean. That's what I'm getting at. So, like, if you remove them by um, uh, to deploying them as an uninstall through uh, through Intune, then yes. But if you go through and do the uh, the explosion, the bomb script that everyone seems to have, that rips it out from the base, like almost through like dism, then it never comes back. Yeah, I, I haven't seen the scripts that are floating around. Um, uh, yes, you have. Do you, you have? Not, not anything that we know who have written, but I, there's there's a handful of them. Yeah, yeah, I, I avoid them because I just. Yeah, the correct the correct way is to find the applications from the store. Yes. And then deploy them as an uninstall, please, um, so that they are removed. But if you reset and the device, please. then they can potentially come back. <laughs> There's been way too many stories that I've that I have personally heard. People will have a script that removes all the bloatware from Windows 10, and then when Notepad was removed from <laughs> that was things, so funny. <laughs> it never came back. And it was non-retrievable. You couldn't get it back. Yep, you had to um, re reset the whole OS. It's, it, but not, yeah, not not even reset, OS. like factory re-image. Re yeah. Um, so it's just yeah. My my concern is that I've seen it go bad. Yeah, too many times. And there's also a, a proper way to do it as well. So the, the one I laugh about is when you have to go and previously remove the Windows holographic. To do that, you have to mount the image without it being loaded and remove the binaries and then it won't appear. Don't do that. Please don't do that. Just just leave yeah. it on and trust your users won't click on it. Yes. And also, Eddie, yes, removing the store is also fun, but don't do it. <laughs> just disable it. <laughs> yeah. There's a registry key for it. Um, yeah. But, well, then, and that's probably a question I want to put out to the crowd here. How many people, show of hands, comments in the chat, how many people are disabling the store for their staff? For the general population, I'm not talking chaos because I'm not talking like managed computers, I'm talking like general population. The follow-up question is why? Let me get the answer <laughs> first. Because I see that you're typing. So how many computers are you removing it from? All of them. Can't trust them. You're exactly. Gonna that is the point, Eddie. What? We don't see this. No. Most uh, staff couldn't be asked downloading apps from the store. But also, more importantly, it doesn't matter if they download apps from yeah. the store. Because if they do, and it's bad, you go and uninstall it. Yeah. Um, in saying that, <sighs> I'm... I see both sides of it now because, say, for example, you have a DLP concern and you have a, say, for example, and this is the scenario that was explained to me, um, a an employee goes and installs Evernote. Mm. All your corporate data is now going into that application and you sure. have no control over it. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. yeah, like you'd have to have whip or etc. Yeah. I'm not saying anything on that. I know. Yeah, I said a trigger word. Um, <laughs> what you would have to do is use app lock, um, app lock, app yeah. With um, block rules if you want to explicitly block an application or allow a store application. So that's the scenario. If you're in a regulated industry where you need to make sure data isn't leaking your environment. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but 
for most organizations where you don't have those requirements or it's less of a concern, it doesn't matter. It goes back to that thing that we've always said, it's defaults until you need to modify them. So yep. defaults are still there. Like people use it if they, if they absolutely think that they need the latest version of uh, the freemium solitaire, then go for it. Yep, it works well. Yeah, exactly. I like the fact that the name of the computer is Surface Pro 5, even though there was no Surface Pro 5, it was just a Surface Pro. <laughs> <laughs> or is that the fifth Surface Pro that you're working with? Probably. <laughs> yeah, I've got, yeah, I've got four more sitting at home. They just sort of cycle through them because I love turning on a machine I haven't used before and mm -hmm. trying to use it that day. I, I know that feeling. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, all my edge profiles are not here. Oh, I need to start go signing into all my profiles. Um, you'd be the same as me where you'd have like a list of AAB tenants. Yeah. Yep. And, I, and yeah, so now it's end of year. I'll have time to go through, go through, clean up my Azure subscriptions, get rid of Azure AD tenants I don't need anymore. I don't bother trying to delete them. I just do the... I am well, freeing <laughs> myself from you. You can have adventures in the wild. My like credit Milo cards have been removed. Yeah, like, like Milo and Otis. It's like, go out, have adventures without me. <laughs> That's where you just leave a random, like, um, free VM running <laughs> with an open honey. <laughs> Let's see what we can have up here. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, no, I've, I've got a spreadsheet of the AAD tenants I need to keep. Like, <laughs> oh, no, it's, not a, it's not a big list, it's, but it's just more so that I can track what's actually in them um, yes. and whether, and then every now and then it's like, I don't need that stuff anymore. That can, that can go. I, I understand completely. I, I'm currently sitting at about 15 tenants. Yeah. No, I don't. The one that gets in, gets really annoying is when you've gone in and done AAD Connect and Windows Hello for Business, and then you turn off the VMs and you get a message every few hours. Oh, saying, yeah. Your AD sync's not working. It's like, yeah, no. Yeah, but eventually it stops. <laughs> yeah, like it doesn't go. Like it only bugs you for a day or two. Yeah. But then when you turn that VM on again, it starts again. It says, oh, it's everything's good again. But then you shut it off two hours later and it's another two days of notifications. Yes, I may I may have experienced that from time to time. <laughs> yeah. I'm more reactive. Like I just wait and then one day just the cost alarm I said pops in and says like you're like down to sixty dollars on this thing. I go like, what? And then I forgot to turn off that firewall. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Bastion. Bastion always gets me. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know anybody that used $300 in a month on. Uh, oh, I, re I remember when you did that. <laughs> no, no, this, no, is, this uh, is a different one. Oh, different. you've done it again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, it was the donuts. Sugar hit double yeah. sugar hit Coke and donuts. Where's the Domino's? Where's Dirty the pizzas, Dom. Mark? Remember no, we used I, to do I, them I, at the reactor I, or wherever it was, and we go down and get pizzas. Yeah, that'll that'll be next year, Phil. Yeah, we'll, yeah uh, I'm uh, looking forward maybe, to maybe it. Maybe we can coax you into actually showing up. Yeah, a taste of Italy is down. Uh, in the don't lab. go there. I oh, don't go there. I explained <laughs> to Stephen. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Probably not something to record there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. well, it's just family. Don't. Yeah. I had a friend of mine whose daughter went to a party on Saturday, got diagnosed with Omicron, and so the whole family's now in quarantine for seven days. Fun. Yeah. Not me, but, yeah. you know, I don't want to turn up just catching a train. I know you guys are all good, but catching a train, I come home and get tested and find out my family. That's fair. Gatherings yeah. this weekend with weakened immune system Guests is destroyed. Yep. I'm happy to take the virus. I am. I know that I've had double vax. I'm all good. It's just, mm -hmm. yeah, it's the other. Yes. Yep. Uh, but I think we'll probably end up going for dinner tonight at uh, Hunter Gatherer, Phil. 
Oh, nice. Yep. That's great memories of another meetup. Yeah, but like proper food, not the cake. Food. food we used to have. Yeah. Too bad George couldn't join us. Yep. <laughs> yes, it's a lot better than the Hunter Connection food court. <laughs> I'd agree with that. Oh God, Hunter Connection. <laughs> <laughs> I could. It's probably been ten years since I've walked through Hunter Connection, but I could probably predict what food places they have in there. It's just the same level of quality from. Yeah. It's like a, it's like an off Bamery Chinese. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, remember, this is being recorded. <laughs> um, it's not critical. But, but it's but just a, a fact. It's uh, yeah. Bamery food. Oh God. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the Hunter connection connection is nothing like the Rainbow Connection. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Well, they get some cheap food down there, though. Yeah. You could. Yeah, definitely. Oh, okay. Well, I guess we can probably wrap it up. We haven't yeah. spoken about anything tech related for the last ten or fifteen minutes. I was thinking so. so. I might just hit stop on the recording for that one. So, thanks everyone. Enjoy the rest of year. If you get to have holidays, um, don't do anything too stupid. If you do and you live, tell us what it was. And so we want to see the video. Mistakes. Don't go to Newcastle. We video later. <laughs> <laughs> which which new? I think that applies to both Newcastles. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah. <laughs> see you, Phil. Okay, see you, Phil. See you guys. Have a merry Christmas, happy New Year, yeah, and a congratulations on our excellent series. You guys run an awesome event, and push, push, push to get more people to learn from all of you. Awesome, mate. Thank you. Indeed. Cheers. Great to see you, Phil. See you. Bye. See you in the new year.